Today on Sabaton History, Angels Calling. However, we already did Angels Calling, yeah. but Angels Calling has a second life because we choose to re-record it again, together with Apocalyptica. And there is so much more to be said about trench warfare that we could probably do 30 episodes about Angels Calling if we wanted to. All right, take it away. As you may have noticed, this is not the regular Sabaton history set. This is being filmed in my living room in Stockholm because of the pandemic. Anyhow, if you're like me, when you find yourself discussing the horrors of trench warfare with a stranger on the bus or a girl at a party, yes, you start to notice that a lot of people have a very basic understanding of the Great War that the war was fought by soldiers who in the beginning marched cheerfully to war in 1914, but then had to enter the world of the trenches. There they spent most of their time only to go over the top from time to time to fight the fellas on the other side in, in their trenches. Those lucky enough to survive would then leave the trenches in 1918. Well, of course, it was a little bit more complex than that. And by a little, I mean like, like, like a million times more complex than that. In Angels Calling Part 1, I talked about the soldiers' lot in the new age of industrialized warfare. How the days in the trenches were best described as long periods of boredom and waiting that were suddenly interrupted by brief periods of violence and chaos. The trenches were on all fronts of the war, in all climates, and they were not just deep ditches in the ground. In over a thousand kilometers on the western front, from the north sea to the Swiss border, for example, it was a complex and sophisticated network, supported by dugouts and redoubts in an interlocking, interconnected system. Despite the common myths, the soldier in the forward firing lines would not typically remain there for very long. The constant shelling and sniper fire eroded morale, and discipline suffered accordingly. Men and weapons were consumed by filth. The, the unburied corpses and the fleas would spread disease and the fighting spirit sank from the constant stress and sleeplessness. Even during the big battles, when soldiers were virtually trapped in their dugouts and bunkers, it was still expected that, that there was a somewhat regular rotation system in place that cycled the men through the lines. In early 1915, most battalions could be expected to remain in position for two weeks before being replaced. That time was halved a year later. In 1917, the usual period of time for soldiers to be in the firing trench was between four to six days a month. From there, they went to their supporting line, then later to the reserves, and finally all the way back to the billets. Returning to the rear, the men entered the world of military logistics. Here they were provided with regular baths, church services, concerts, cinemas, brothels, and of course, postal service. The German Postal Service alone was recorded to have sent over 28 billion letters, packages, and postcards back and forth between the front and home. And all of these things were of vital importance. The widespread army mutinies of 1917 in France, Italy, and Russia were to a large part caused by the unwillingness of the common soldier to return to the hellish conditions at the front. Although there was also an element of being unwilling any longer to be cannon fodder and highly wasteful offensives. But they wanted the rotation system improved, more frequent leaves to the rear, and an end to mail being withheld as a punishment. Most historians agree that the major reason why the British Army did not suffer any major mutinies during the war was because they kept their logistical system running smoothly, which kept the men in better spirits. The British introduced a nutritional model that provided their soldiers 4,000 calories a day each. Meat, bread, fresh and dried vegetables, of course biscuits and tea, jam, sugar, milk, even otherwise luxury items like tobacco and rum were never in short supply. This was a diet of which the Germans and Austro-Hungarians could have only dreamed. But that was 4,000 calories a day 
for a mobilized army of over 2.6 million men in 1916. And that number only kept rising to, to never before seen numbers. They had to dress all those men, supply them with weapons and ammunition, repair their boots, manufacture helmets, Every infantryman wore fighting order. The normal equipment, including steel helmet and entrenching tool, less the pack and greatcoat, with rolled ground sheet, water bottle, and haversack in place of the pack on the back. In the haversack were small things, mess tin, towel, shaving kit, extra socks, message book, two days ration, extra cheese, one preserved ration, and one iron ration. Two gas helmets and tear goggles were carried, also wire cutters, field dressing, and iodine. Officers and NCOs carried four flares. Moving from dump to dump, the men picked up, besides 220 rounds of small arms ammunition, two sandbags and two mills grenades, these last only to be thrown by trained bombers. Each leading company also took 10 picks and 50 shovels. This quote is often used to describe how overburdened the British soldier was at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, but it also shows us how many different tools were expected to be carried into a battle of unknown duration. Each nation had to mass produce such common things in the millions and also keep up a functioning logistic and supply system that could bring those things from the factory to the front lines. And this was just 1916, when the age of the mass producing war economy was just beginning. The year of battles, as this year was called, had produced such an unsustainable number of casualties for everyone that the nations looked to industry to fight the war for them. The British, of course, stood with their backs to an empire. The Imperial Munitions Board continuously reached out to its colonies and dominions for help. They imported tin from Malaya, chromium from South Africa, lead from Australia. Canada and India developed their own armaments industries and produced millions of shells and cartridges. Everything else was purchased. Pyrite from Spain, aluminum from the United States, and most importantly, sodium nitrate from Chile. Actually, the Allied war effort became so dependent on the nitrate salts from Chile, which were essential for the propellant for artillery shells, that in the busy moments of the war, just one lost shipment at sea could have halted the entire shell production of all Allied factories. Between April 1917 and November 1918, the British manufactured 121 million shells through the system, but even they were outclassed by the French, who produced nearly 150 million. France's GDP was not even half that of Britain, but its industry was permanently working on its absolute limits. In 1914, around 50,000 people had worked in the French armament industry. That number rose to 1.675 million in 1918. It produced everything en masse for the war effort, and yet also supplied the war in the Balkans and sent guns and shells to Russia until the revolution. By the end of the war, France had built a giant new industry around heavy guns, aircraft, and tanks, with Renault being able to produce 278 light tanks in just the month of July 1918 alone. France did not only have the largest air force in the world by the end of the war, but also the industry to sustain it. Same sort of went for Italy, which had rapidly built and modernized its war economy by mobilizing hundreds of thousands of men and women into the factories of Caproni, Ansaldo, and Fiat. Italy was one of the least industrialized nations of Europe before the war, but now kept large armies supplied on its own. It could lose 3,000 artillery pieces in the Battle of Caporetto in 1917 and have them replaced not even a year later for the counteroffensive. However, the factories were overseen with military discipline. Strikes were simply forbidden, and safety regulations was a term you would only stumble across in an underground socialist newspaper. In Germany, the Hindenburg program of 1917 had put the whole German economy and large parts of Austro-Hungarian industry under centralized control. It demanded a doubling of munition production, a tripling of machine guns and artillery. The German War Department allocated all available raw materials and substitutes for a single purpose, continuing the war. The German industry suffered heavily from the British economic blockade but it was still able to match the production of the Allies when it came to the tools of trench warfare. However, 
It also had to supply its allies with aircraft, artillery, helmets, and rifles. Austria-Hungary was shaken by 1918. Bulgaria close to economic collapse, and the Ottoman population was starving. But the fighting in the trenches had to be kept going, and they looked for affordable technical innovations to keep it going. Although the Livens gas projector, for example, had been invented in Britain as a simple tool to kill as many Germans as cheaply as possible, it was the German industry that supplied a whole system of gas warfare. In 1918 alone, for the spring offensive, they produced 18,700,000 gas shells. By the end of the war, it is estimated that over 110,000 tons of poison gas had been released over the battlefields of the war by all nations combined. And it could have been way more. The US was preparing for gas warfare as well. And while the Germans could produce around 18 tons of gas a day, the US calculated that it could produce 200 tons a day in mid-1919. Imagine that. But despite the innovations, what the German army could not mass produce were horses and trucks. The age of cavalry was at its end, but all armies still relied on draft animals for transport. The German motor park could only field 23,000 transport vehicles, but the shortage of rubber meant that they had to drive on steel tires, which destroyed the roads. Oil consumption had pretty much doubled in all countries, but Germany had imported 90% of its oil even before the war. They had to reach to Romania and as far as Baku to even remotely keep up with the everyday demands in gasoline and lubricants. Throughout the war, all sides relied on a sophisticated supply system to keep the war from stopping dead in its tracks. So the trenches cast a long shadow backwards, all the way to the workbench of the munitions industry or the nitrate mines and oil fields on the other side of the world. The Great War was not just the war of the common soldier that went into the fight rifle in hand. It was also the war of financiers, of manufacturers, and of bureaucrats, without whom the soldiers at the front would have to resort to fighting with sticks and stones. Modern war demanded a long supply chain, from the factory to the front. In the end, the mud-caked face of the tired soldier in the trench was not that different from the canary, the woman whose skin turned yellow from tirelessly working through the night with toxic chemicals to make shells. The horrors of trench warfare reached far behind, even to those that were seemingly a safe distance away from the artillery and sniper fire. Angels were not just calling for names, they were calling for shells, they were calling for butter, they were calling for shoes. Okay, so how did this with Apocalyptica and you guys come about? All right, first of all, it was uh, an idea when we were sitting and brainstorming what kind of bands we want to take with us on tour. And uh, normally, traditionally, looking to other rock bands and stuff like that. We so you weren't thinking about Venga Boys or the 90s R&B bands? Not this time. Not this time. Not this time. We, we were thinking about different heavy metal bands, traditional ah. heavy metal bands that we could take with us on tour. But we were thinking also outside of the box, and there was Apocalyptica. And then I, when, when I started to digest the idea of Apocalyptica, which is a cello rock band, yeah. uh, they play heavy metal but with cellos. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I started to think, okay, uh, what can we do more with them? If they are just performing on the stage as an opening act of us, okay, it's pretty cool, but can we do something more? So I got on a flight, I was checking the, the Apocalyptica touring schedule. Okay. I saw that they had a show in Madrid. Okay. I fly down there, I watched their show. I got lots of ideas when I watched it. And then I met with the guys afterwards and I explained right. what I would like to do. I would like that we, we take it to a deeper um, working together. We, we try to create some music together and they love the idea. Mm -hmm. So we, we set up dates around the Sab Sabaton Open Air Festival in Fallon. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys- Which year was this, when was this? Uh, this was uh, last summer last in summer. 2019. 
So we asked the guys in Apocalyptica to come and play yeah. at the Sabaton Open Air, and they were excited to come, and they stayed for a couple of days. And we went into our rehearsal space, and we just started to work on something. We didn't know what is going to turn out, All right. but we have the album The Great War out about World War One. In the past, we have done a couple of songs about, also about World War One. Yeah. One of them was Angels Calling. Sure. And I thought that this song with the dun, 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 yeah. this riff, oh, yeah. it makes so much sense to do it on a cello as well. Yeah. So when we started to practice it, it felt very natural. And the song has so many different uh, parts where everybody have space to play their instrument to the full. As we were developing this song, uh, rehearsing it, practicing it, we realized it's a great song to do it with. Yeah. And... Uh, so that's a little bit how Angel's Calling received a secondary life. It was tricky because we didn't have, when we were together, we couldn't do a music video completely for it because right. even if we were rehearsing it together, we didn't know how it's in the end it's going to turn out because the actual song we recorded in two different studios and um, later at a later time. But then we met in um, Helsinki uh, before the first show of the tour and we went to the stage and like, okay, guys, let's... Um, Let's see if we can play this stuff together now That's and cool. uh, do it on the on the stage and then yeah. let's do it on the tour. And it actually led to us performing uh, even uh, several more songs on the tour together. Yeah. And I think that the tour, which is now unfortunately over, yeah. uh, but it turned out to be absolutely amazing. And I think the highlight of us in the band and a lot of people in the crowd was the moment when Apocalyptica joins us on stage. We play together and we open by playing the song Angels Call. So back to the actual subject at hand today, the supplies and the colossal numbers that you need for trench warfare. When you hear those numbers, just to supply like one mile for one army, and you're talking hundreds of thousands of potatoes a week for four years, and that's one mile out of a 500 mile front but only one side for one army. I mean, what do, you, what do you make you think when you think of the stunning numbers there? I think, what's the price of a mile? <laughs> ah, oh, you did it, man. Oh, see, you got me. Okay. No, uh, actually, you should only answer me with Sabaton titles. Everything I say, you should have a title. In time. No, it's absolutely stunning. I know for our touring, the logistics around our touring is pretty intense. People yeah. see the show. They don't know the, the logistics around it. We travel with lots of trucks. And uh, on the on the past tour, we had um, we had with us seven trucks and one hundred crew members, oh. only to be able to do the the shows on that. And okay, that's us. That's sustaining five guys. Hey, yeah, you just reminded me of something. Complete side note: um, I was reading in a, a Mojo like Mojo Mag like twenty years ago about um, you know c catastrophic tours and stuff. And the and I remember when I was a kid a little bit about this. My big sister used to talk about it. Uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's American tour in like 1976 or something. Three guys, right? Um, it had a whole bunch of buses because they had 200 crew for the three guys thing. But one guy was in charge of the carpets. You know, they had like these, it lost so much money. It was, it was sold out, but it was still absolutely catastrophic. It could not make the money. Do you have a carpet guy? Uh, we don't have a carpet guy, but we have a lot of people who are yoga really guy. We have a yoga guy. Okay, cool. You need a yoga guy. Uh, and well, we have a physiotherapist with us on tour so that we don't break. <laughs> Pablo. Yes. Yeah, he's cool. Hey, Pablo. <laughs> um, and hey, if the Emerson, Lake and Palmer carpet guy, who's probably out of a job now, I don't know if you need a carpet guy, but maybe if he's out there watching, 
If we some of you guys know, carpet. some of you guys know the Emerson Lake and Palmer carpet guy. I don't know his name. I don't know, if, if 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 somebody does the research and looks up his name, print it on the screen right now. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, that was great. Um, well, thanks for today, Par. Thank you. And we'll see you next time here on the Sabaton History Channel. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you everybody for supporting and those who don't do it click the bell subscribe and become a patron thank you very much